My guest today is a professional basketball player. She's played for the Las Vegas Empress of the W. WBA and been featured on Bleacher Report and Millions.co. She's currently playing for COD McKenna's in Morocco. I'm excited to welcome Anaya Rodisha. Hello. Hello. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Um yeah. I I told you before we get started, like I'm I'm in your old stomping grounds right now, uh, on Bainbridge Island. You you we met when you were playing for Peninsula, right? Yeah. I was up in Peninsula College at the time. Yeah, and you're you're back in Vegas now, right now? Yeah, yeah. I left Morocco around uh, like end of July. Okay. Early August, so I thought it was going to be like calling you in Morocco. So I I like <laughs> prep some of my questions for you based off of that. But I definitely like I'm stoked. I I followed your journey. We met at an airport just randomly. I think in Vegas or in Phoenix. I. I don't know. I thought we were leaving Seattle. We I don't remember. It was such a long time ago, but I know that we met either we were going to Seattle or leaving. I can't remember. Yeah, because you had like a I think you had a Broncos stuffed <sighs> animal or something. It was a, around the time the Seahawks. Oh, oh don't say that. <laughs> I had, I got a good memory. So I I That's we ended up talking man. and you said I think you were either traveling to go back to the team or something like I can't remember but you how long did you play out here for I was in Washington for three years because I only got there and went to Skagit Valley but then um, didn't play there transferred to Peninsula College and spent my two years there playing just the outskirts of Washington State too (laughs) right did you like it up here like do I mean I did not like Skagit. Mount Vernon was not fun at all. But Peninsula was really nice because I'm one of those like, oh, my gosh, look at the view, look at the sky. And then, mm-hmm. you know, you have Canada on the other side. So there wasn't much to complain about other than being so far away from the city. For but, sure. Is that were those D2 or D3? Duco. Yeah, those are my junior college years. So, gotcha. like, yeah, two years before the university. And then you went to the Bay? Yep. Silicon Valley went to and graduated from Notre Dame, Dana Mary University. That was a D2, NCAA D2, Pac West mm-hmm. team. So, and then really you, nice. you, like, how long were you out there for? Cause we talked a while ago when you were, you were doing some social media stuff. Yeah. Like, like while you were in Vegas, but. Yeah. So I spent, three years in Washington and then I think we met my first year up there or like my second year and then I moved to the bay for three years so I was there from 2017 to 2020 when COVID hit and uh once COVID hit actually that I spent a, after my two years of playing I spent another year going to school and I just decided to stop playing basketball after season ended and join the regular life see what that was about for the first time and I loved it and that's when I got into like social media marketing real estate marketing and all sorts of different marketing stuff but you you ended up going back to hoops yeah after COVID was honestly my COVID experience wasn't bad at all because I was working traveling Mm -hmm. making money like I had no issues or nothing to complain about So after doing all that and kind of just like quitting because I wasn't happy, I decided to go back into the gym and I was like, wow, I actually miss playing. Mm -hmm. Just got back into it and ended up joining the Las Vegas Empress on a whim. Like I knew they had tryouts and everything, wasn't interested. I was just like playing basketball up at the gym one day and the coaches were like, come try out. And I came and I went and the rest was history from there starting back open again what is the wba i can't even say it i like, I, so there's always it. an n yeah yeah it's women's basketball association so it's a semi-pro bat women's basketball league where players can come and play potentially earn contracts with agents and you know go the overseas route or you know get scouted by an nba wnba scout and you know it's just like a minor league 
organization that you know holds games for teams in different states yeah when you came back did you have like a different outlook on the game at all or like did that time away help you at all the time away looking back at the at the transition now I can say the time away that I spent from basketball was so worth it um I was hooping you know every year of my life all throughout school so like that time away was so needed to just know how to be a normal person outside of basketball and then coming back into it looking at basketball was kind of just like it was more so like a question of whether I wanted to really dive back into the you know industry and lifestyle but um I can say that my outlook on basketball now from playing and coming back like it's a whole different like I know that I if, if I would have done things way differently before I probably would have never stopped mm-hmm. to be honest yeah for sure hey I forgot to say just at the beginning of this um if you are watching us on YouTube make sure to hit that like button share subscribe and then notifications bell and if you do have a question for Anaya or myself throw it in the comment section doing so helps us with the algorithm sorry yeah. to just no, 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 you through that but yeah I, I was just thinking because I I play but I you know definitely not at like a competitive level but that those two years of like COVID knocked out any basketball and when we came back it was so fucking funny like the guys that we run with like twice a week or whatever the first day back like it was the first possession some guy like rolled his ankle as soon as like, oh my God. and he just fell on his face, you know, like, but if you play basketball regularly, like it's such a, like people that play, they play all the time, like ev- every, yeah. and to be away from it for what, like, were you still hooping, like just for, for fun casually, or did you just completely go away from the game? Oh, I can, uh, I can say that while I was in school, you know, I wouldn't shy away from pulling up to open gym a few times mm-hmm. just to beat on the the college kids that were still there but uh I remember I tried out for a semi-pro team in Oakland and um, I was super excited to get into that um the tryout was super competitive it was like two days and that was probably the most competitive thing that I've done while being out and then of course COVID hit, so that didn't happen. And uh when I got back, it was more so just like playing around, mm-hmm. you know, sort of thing. And then that's when I was I literally broke, I think, almost all of my fingers that year trying to come back playing because it was just like, you know, my body wasn't used to it. I wasn't the strength wasn't there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was horrible. <laughs> Were how many like major injuries have you had? Because you've been doing this at a high level for your almost your entire life right like uh, um I haven't thankfully actually I've I haven't personally injured myself in basketball but I did have a teammate at PC like she like ran into a post player going up for a layup and ended up like ricocheting off her body sitting on my ankle like my foot and then like her back like went against my leg and I ended up like breaking my tibia and my uh, ankle just oh. from that yeah and so it was like the end of the season I was super nervous because you know that's when an athlete gets their offers and decide where they're going Mm -hmm. I think I was in a boot and on crutches for like two three weeks and I was like you know what I need to play like I played in playoffs ended up getting like a offer and I was like I'm gonna take it because with a broken tibia yeah my tibia was and I didn't even know I was walking on it for a while because I knew my ankle was broken at first I thought it was just sprained and then like 4 a.m. that night I had to go to the doctor because I was like (laughs) I'm in so much pain and I didn't know my tibia was broken until like March and I think that happened in like February yeah I was back home and I was like you play on it like what did you do just tape it or what oh yeah there's like pictures of me in playoffs with like kinetic tape on my knee because I'm like thinking my knees messed up and I'm like in this huge ankle brace but yeah I was I was all broken up (laughs) When when you were talking about like all the prep stuff for the semi pro team, like, yeah. do you think all that training and because you're you're I mean I follow you on social media like when you're playing and stuff like you put a lot of time in the gym and in your body and all that. Do you think you play better when you're looser and not doing all that stuff, or mm. do you think 
all that stuff makes you better? That's a really good question because I, when I got back into basketball, my senior year, first of all, college, I was not lifting like that. You know, our program wasn't that great. So we weren't doing a lot of strength and conditioning already. So then when I got back into basketball after COVID, I did not like take it serious. You know, I'd go to the gym and I'd shoot so I can make threes. I'd work on my layups so I can make layups, but I wasn't taking in the fact that my body needed to get stronger at the level that I was playing at. So I, yeah, I definitely rolled my ankle a thousand times more. Yeah. Like, and I broke all my fingers. I had a hip injury. So that's why I take so much time now to stay in the gym and to make sure my body's strong enough to play at the level that I'm at, because not only do I have to play stronger, I have to go up against stronger women. So like that is already a toll, like getting pushed around and beat up. You, can really hurt yourself so yeah it definitely matters (laughs) i just i wonder though like because you see some of these basketball players that are like super lean and and like like skinny and and the game has changed where like everybody's pretty built now and like really strong but like from a preventative standpoint i think it makes sense but like from Mm -hmm. an actual like you're having less fun if you're training all the time like it's So and it's like you have to understand as an athlete, young athletes have to understand like you have to love that part. And that's where it's literally the part that's the most fun, because you if you're competitive, like if if you have a competitive nature, you're trying to beat yourself every day in the gym. And so like if you're not going at that and you're just relying on the games for the competitive aspect, like if you take an L, it's going to be a hard L instead of just thinking like oh now I know what I need to work on in the gym like I'm gonna go super hard at it you know so it's not fun when you don't want to do it or you don't want to wake up at 6 a.m to go lift or run but it yeah. always up in the end I was I was just I was watching that Netflix um thing about the redeem team <laughs> it was like LeBron and Carmelo and Kobe and all those guys I think in 2008 like yeah after, after the olympics team and it was so funny because they were talking about kobe's mentality mm-hmm. and how like he woke up at 4 30 in the morning and like was doing like going to the gym when those guys were out in vegas coming back from the club yeah. and kobe's, kobe's go in the lobby going to the gym and all those guys are, are coming back from the club and they they asked carmelo like because LeBron started waking up at 4 30 and going with Kobe and like Chris Paul did and all these guys. And then Carmar Carmelo's like, Yeah, I didn't do that at all. I <laughs> I never woke up in the morning like that. I'm not waking up at 4 30 in the morning to yeah. go work out. And so I I I don't know. Like I think there's a it's everybody's different, right? Yeah. It I've takes noticed- some to be a monster. Like you literally have to embody some kind of like other being to you know withstand all that because yeah 4 30 in the morning every day or like any day just imagine trying that right now and like not even getting out of bed like it's so hard I almost <laughs> went to bed at 4 30 last morning <laughs> <laughs> last night yeah <laughs> God. yeah so it's... you were at the empress you were playing for them in Vegas and then how did you get the offer from Morocco Um, We had just won the championship with Las Vegas Empress, and I think I received an email or a text message. Somehow an agent, my agent got in contact with me, and he was like, uh, he's like, what are your goals? You know, we talked about it, and I was like, my goal since I was a kid, like, I want to go play overseas. I want to win a championship. That's my goal. He was like, okay, well, we can definitely get you overseas, and then you know, I was like, okay, well now I actually have to start training because that entire time, you know, I, like I told you, I was just going to the gym and getting shots up. Yeah. Not really taking, you know, I love Steph Curry, like half court threes. Oh yeah. I was not taking it serious. You know, I was cheating the game. So I was like, okay, I need to actually get in the gym with some legit people who are going to make me better. And, uh, got back in the gym and I think that was in like August of 2021 and then November came and they were like we have an offer for you but um there was a second wave of COVID like the SARS virus or whatever so I they shut 
the borders down in Morocco, couldn't go then. And then um, after that, I just, <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm laughing at my mom. <laughs> after that, uh, the borders didn't open up until like February. So that's when I was able to leave Morocco, but I would have been there from like November to July had the second wave not hit. Oh, you would have been stuck in Morocco? I would have been there earlier, but yeah, not stuck. That yeah, was gotcha. the end. so we you can couldn't get, get over there. Yeah, because yeah, they had, they had closed their borders and they, you know, every day was a every week was a waiting game, like checking the CDC website, like are are their borders open? I'm ready to leave now, but it all paid off in the end. I was way better when I left than when I would have left. Oh shit! Okay, so you had time to like get better and stuff. So what oh, yeah. was it like once you got there? Ah, when I first got there, it was freezing cold. Like no one expects Africa or like the Sahara <laughs> Desert area to be cold. But I was freezing. Like I did not bring a coat or anything. And it was like pouring down rain, super cold. You know, that was a big adjustment. And, you know, they don't have heaters in other countries like that. So I was like surfing Amazon to see what I could order right away. And like the shipping fees were like $90. So that was out. And then um, I just remember wondering what I was going to be eating when I first got there. And that was like the exciting part because I'm like, I want to try everything. And right away, I was like stuffing my face with everything. And that was pretty cool. The language was hard because Arabic, they speak Arabic and French in Morocco. Mm -hmm. So it was like, you couldn't really differentiate whether it was French or Arabic and they, Moroccan people, I don't know if it's like Arabic culture, but Moroccan people talk at the same time. Mm. So like you'll, you'll meet people and they'll be like, salam, but like, as you're saying, salam alaikum, they're like, salam alaikum, like, sa va, sa va bien. Well, it's like a, they're like eating whole, each like, other's words. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then you just part ways and that's just the conversation, but. Yeah, it was a big adjustment at first. Yeah. Just, How was the, did the food end up being, because I've been to like China and Colombia and like the food is always an adjustment. Like you go into any convenience store, it's like they have like the like blue raspberry Doritos and like just the right. weirdest stuff. Yeah, their snacks are way different. Um, We had basically, okay, so basically it was me and another American there we had um, basically our point of person that we could go to who spoke both languages, like Arabic, French, and English. Mm -hmm. So when we first got there, you know, she was helping us get adjusted by cooking for us. She always cooked for us every night, cooking for us. And so that was okay because she was leaning it on like what we were coming from versus what we we're coming into. So a lot of our food was like rice and veggies at first. And then like we sort of got into couscous and like tagines and like other cuisines like that or not cuisines, but like, you know, menu items. And that was really cool. Like the food is amazing. I miss it every day. Really? I do, would I would so take Moroccan food over American food. I hate to say it, but I would in a heartbeat. So what was like the best thing you ate and the grossest thing you ate because there's definitely when you're traveling like that like you try something you're like yeah I'm not eating that again yeah, yeah. right away I did not try goat milk ever again like what were we eating we went to this like one of my favorite ended up being one of my favorite restaurants but they drink milk with a lot of things so my teammate ordered like some kind of milk with her couscous and she's like shows us this video where they take goat milk and they put it in goat skin and they basically have people like in the middle of like the mountains or whatever and they shake this goat milk and it makes like whatever kind of consistency and they drink it just like that and I was like okay I'll try it the nastiest thing I've ever tried in my life I'll never try it again was it um, the texture or the taste or what was it it was a hundred percent nasty taste. This is disgusting. Like, <laughs> I don't even know. How to, it tasted like sour milk. Yeah. Like that's the best I can put it. Just like <laughs> thinking your cereal is going to be that good. And then your milk sour. That's exactly the taste. Ugh. Yeah, it was horrible. 
Yeah, that and visual like, of them just that, shaking it too. Is, yeah, is no, it's like nasty. if you look at a video, they put it in like this goat skin, and it looks like this big, huge sack that's like on two strings, and they're just—it's disgusting. So nasty. <laughs> it's nasty. <laughs> yeah. So the best thing though, what did you? What was your favorite thing that you ate? Um, for a meal, definitely tagine. Okay. Which is like I didn't realize that it was just like crock pot food when I came back because I'm like I want tagine I want tagine then I realized it's just food in a crock pot yeah that's the style yeah but they basically take like these ceramic um kind of like a pot so it's like a base at the bottom and then it's like this triangular thing like this at the top and they put the pot or they put the bottom on the stove and they put like potatoes meat olive oil and like whatever else they don't really like season their food too crazy but like um paprika and stuff like that and it just sits in the pot you close it and it cooks there and then when it's done you literally take it off the stove and you just eat it with bread it's like the most healthiest thing ever but it's so good it's so so good that's awesome so yeah. how, was, how was the basketball though african basketball i'll say moroccan basketball is very it's hard to get adjusted to. I'll say that as an American, because we come from like organized basketball, like skilled basketball and just, you know, a different level. Mm-hmm. And in Moroccan basketball it was so hard to get adjusted at first. Like just understanding my position as a player on the team. That was number one. On top of not understanding your teammates was hard. Number two, but playing against other teams like there's just no it's not a lot of structure at the level that I was playing at and so it was like it was just hard and confused confusing at first because like you don't go we didn't go over plays and practice at all ever like Mm -hmm. hard and then practice was kind of just like sporadic drills and sporadic things so it was like it's really hard to get into a groove and so that's what I had to learn like I have to lock into my game and lock into my world. So when I'm on the court, I do the things that I'm good at and I work on the things that I'm, you know, good at so I can get better. Mm-hmm. But yeah, at first it was a really hard adjustment trying to figure it out. Can you explain a little bit more? Like just, uh, was it so American styles, like high pick and roll structured plays? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, so- outside <laughs> shooting. Like how was the game different? Yeah, so, like, um, women's basketball in America is definitely a strategic game. Like, compared to, you know, the NBA, WNBA's strategy. You know, you run plays, you're working through that. Moroccan basketball is more so, like, I'm not really sure what they focus on or what they, you know, the, the goal is for each game. But I can say that it's different in the sense that you don't practice that strategy at all before the game. So it's like you kind of go in blindsided, not knowing there's no you don't watch film in America. Every level that I've played at, we've watched film, whether on us from before or on the team that we're going to play. So we did none of that. So I was going into like a lot of these games blindsided of like who I was playing, what the competition was like. And then um, just the difference in that is like you're playing with a team. So it's like you can play up and down basketball all day but if you're not practicing like passing to your teammates or pick and rolls like when it comes game time and you need to make those adjustments because you know a team is doing something for your thing and not to not work you have to adjust to that so it's like trying to adjust in mid game with people who don't speak your language was really hard (laughs) it was just like you know it's a little chaotic because it's like every practice then it's like or after every game it's like we need to work on this like we need to do this but it's like they're like yeah yeah but they what don't really the emphasis on like what did was it just like like team camaraderie or something or what i wish i knew to be honest the team that i played for love them to death um you know love love my teammates to death but i really don't know we kind of went through three coaches the whole time i was there was there for five months so that was like you know the president was really strict on this one team like if we didn't play good or there was no you know 
whatever he was looking for for this one team every time we played them like our coach got fired wow yeah so like my first game I was there for a week and we had our first game that at the end of the week they had a coach the whole season we played that team got blown out out the water coach got fired got a new coach I think we had him for like two or three weeks and ended up playing that team again and he got fired because like we didn't win you know it was our rivals we weren't winning against them and yeah he got fired and then um, we ended up taking on the men's coach after that and he ended up staying with us through the whole season but like we never beat that team and like I think the president was really adamant on beating that team yeah and so it was like this whole thing about it but every time we played that team it was like you know back and forth like trash talking they had an American who wanted to bet us on our game like against them it was like you guys aren't gonna win the championship and blah 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 like you know that back and forth American competitiveness but in the end they ended up not winning at all so non-factor <laughs> yeah so is is the comp like because there's usually like a limit to how many American players can be on teams like this and then like I've heard that a lot of WNBA players like this is what they do in their off season they go play abroad like is the money good like is is that what the driving factor is yeah for sure because the WNBA like it's it's never been my dream to play for the WNBA because of the money aspect of it like I just never seen a point in busting all these hours out for you know not a lot of money because mm -hmm. like it's taxing but yeah they leave to go play overseas because they make millions of dollars like playing there so and I think is there a cap on how much how many players there can be per team yeah so well for what i hear mostly you can only have two import players mm -hmm. so not just americans but like teams will import from other countries as well um but yeah you can only have two and are you treated like just amazing over there? Like you're the the royalty on that team? Oh yeah, yeah. You definitely grow fans, but um you can quickly lose them too if you're not winning. But uh yeah, you you grow fans, people love you, you know, you'll be walking around the city and people will be like, Oh, you play for Kodem, American, like they love you and it's it's a great feeling to know that like you know people come to your games and they cheer for you because you know in the end it matters oh for sure yeah so you mentioned Brittany Griner um yeah, Brittany she she's making millions in Russia yeah like crazy what crazy. do you think as like just your experience being abroad and like what's going on with her like what can you share your thoughts on that at all I can tell you that I'm sure she's scared as hell because um, like just being overseas, yeah, people love you because you're American and you're a professional basketball player, but their lifestyle is completely different. So the things that you think they understand because they show you so much love, they don't. So it's like, you know, she got busted for like, I think it was like little cartridges, of like vape pens or something like that, something so small. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I got sick over there. And this is when I learned that like overseas life is different. And this is where we have a privilege in America. I got really sick, like food poisoning. We, they had like this holiday where they sacrifice a, a lamb and you eat it. Goats and, so, and lambs are not doing you any favors on this yeah, trip. Not at all. Yeah. <laughs> Their animals are not on my side, but they you know sacrificed their lamb I went to my teammate's house in Azra Morocco it's like the forest of Morocco and um her family sacrificed the lamb or whatever you know cured the meat we ended up traveling back home and that night um I just remember feeling super sick and it was hot and everything I figured you know I was just hot tired from the taxi ride and you know stuff like that I got, I was super sick for like two weeks, like bloated stomach, like bad, horrible food poisoning. So I'm like, I need to go to the doctor, go to the hospital. Wait, first of all, let me back up before I even go to the hospital. I, it took forever for me to get, you know, uh, my team to get care for me. 
because they're just like, oh, like, you'll be fine, whatever. Like, my teammate who's normally there that handles things on their side wasn't there. She was out of town. So I'm, like, trying to get in touch with someone who speaks English because, you know, I'm in so much pain. I'm about to faint every five seconds. I don't know what's going on. And uh, I finally am able to get to the hospital. First of all, their hospital walking up to it was like, I couldn't even like explain how much traffic was coming out and into the hospital. It was really weird. So it was like a bunch of people coming out, a bunch of people coming in and you go in, you're like in this lobby area and they have rooms on each wall and it's just like lines everywhere. So we get in line. The person that we were meeting was already standing in line for us. So we get in line and we go in this room and it's like just a room, no doctors or anything. There's just two people sitting at a table and they're like, what's wrong? And they're like talking to them, like telling them like my stomach's hurting, blah, blah, blah. The lady comes up to me. She takes like a toothpick, looks in my mouth and is like, oh, she has, what'd she say? She's like, she has uh, tonsillitis. And so I'm like, we leave. And she's like, yeah, she's saying you need like an antibiotic for your tonsils or whatever. And I'm like, no, like I've had tonsillitis before. I know my tonsils are huge, like whatever. I don't have that. So it's like, I never got to see a doctor and I'm like, no, like I need to see someone. I had to like push the situation. Ended up seeing this doctor at a soccer field in a locker room. Moral of the story. He recommended some drugs to me. I went, got them, took them. Didn't make me feel better. Like literally it's gotten to a point where it's like, I think I have a tapeworm. Like I can't eat. I can't do anything. So I'm freaking out. And just like being an American, you know, we can just easily go to the emergency room. Quick fix. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, like this was like a two week prolonged like sickness. And uh, in the end of it all, like I had to go to like a stomach doctor and they did like uh, MRI or whatever on my stomach. And yeah, I had like really bad food poisoning, like a, a bad worm. It was horrible. Damn. Yeah. It was horrible. feel to just be taking like mystery medicine in a That's foreign another- country too. <laughs> That's another thing. Like, the medicine comes and it's not in English. Like it's either in Arabic or French and like, you know, you can translate French, but yeah, it was, it was hard because I didn't know what I was taking. And I, you know, I was scared. Like, am I going to be okay? I didn't even want to take ibuprofen in like foreign countries. Cause I was like, I can't read this. I don't know what the hell, like you don't know what's in it. And people took stuff when I was traveling where like they took it and they're like yeah I don't think what I took was that (laughs) like they start feeling all weird and it's it's and they also like they sell stuff that you normally can't get like right over the counter you can get like painkillers and stuff like it just it's crazy yeah it's it's so different oh 100 percent. it was it was really hard to understand that too because I'm like First of all, they don't, in Morocco, they have a lot of strict like laws on what they allow in their country. So it was like, you don't know what you're taking because, you know, they don't, they're not importing a lot of things that we import at home here. So it's like, you have no idea where it's coming from or what it is or who it comes from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I was just thinking like yesterday I, I heard, uh, I don't know if you know the FIFA world cup stuff it's in Qatar and like there's a lot of uh issues and concerns around like the uh restrictions that they have in that country Mm. like there's no alcohol sales so it'll be soccer games without beer Uh, yeah is is crazy and then um there's a ban on same-sex marriage there too so like a lot of the teams are, are protesting like did you experience anything similarly in morocco where it was just like uh government restrictions that just seemed crazy or just not crazy but like completely different than what is in our country yeah um i wouldn't say so much government things um i can't really remember any time that we like came across the law like that besides like you know, when we travel, we definitely get stopped by the police, like the federales. Mm -hmm. But um, I can say that during Ramadan was the hardest because things weren't open at all. Oh, yeah. It was weird. Like, we weren't worried about drinking alcohol. 
me and the other American because she's she was from Chicago you know I'm from Vegas two major cities in our country like of course alcohol is a thing in Vegas but like we weren't worried too much about it when we got there but for some reason when Ramadan came around it was like we were stressed out and needed a drink we couldn't get to any liquor store at all really? like it was super banned yeah and just like being on our team we had a lot of like I wouldn't say codes or restrictions, but there was a lot of like, uh, our president watched us for sure as if we were like younger. And so that was like always annoying because like he would ban us from doing anything. Really? Like, yeah, like one time uh, our teammates went home for one of their holidays. I think it was the end of Ramadan. And we were like, yay, things are open now. Like me and the other American, like we have freedom to go do what we want. We don't have anybody to answer to right now. We found a hookah lounge and we went to this hookah lounge. We were in there for like 45 minutes, we went home. And when my teammate came back the next week, she's like, yeah, I got chewed out by our president because he thinks that I took you guys to this hookah lounge. And like, he just thinks that I'm letting you guys do all these bad things and blah, blah, blah. She's like, I told him that I didn't do that. But like, did you guys go out? And I was like, I mean, yeah, we did. But we didn't know like he had eyes around the city like that literally wherever we went wherever we did he knew about it Damn. and it, yeah it was not fun <laughs> how sick though was uh, an actual moroccan hookah lounge it was fun but yeah. it was so hard to order a flavor like oh yeah <laughs> yeah it was it was hard because that was like our first time being out without someone who could translate and so like <laughs> translating on the phone was horrible they didn't know what we were saying but like the hookah was it was it was pretty cool honestly yeah. to see I smoked Moroccan shisha or whatever they call yeah. it. It was fun. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. I mean, mm -hmm. it is kind of lame. Like to get busted for smoking hookah is like, right. That, that's so lame. <laughs> it was just funny because we had no idea where we were at. And so she was like, we were like, what's the big deal? And she's like, well, the one that you went to is for like hookers and like <laughs> girls like that. And so we were like, Oh, we had no idea. <laughs> it was really funny. But... It's funny. Yeah. yeah. All right. So before we get into just the story section, um, I had one listener question like uh, Dallas Chang, a friend of mine, he wanted to know, how do you feel about the pay disparity between leagues like the NBA and WNBA? Yeah. Um, good question. Personally, I can say I feel as though women, the pay gap between women and men's sports goes like this. The NBA has supporters, like women, men, kids, you know, they're branded everywhere almost. And they're into a lot of things that generate the money. The WNBA, probably not so much. They're not in a lot of things that promotes them. You know, it's slowly getting into that, but I genuinely feel like women need to support women in sports for women to get paid the way men get paid. You know, the money comes from supporter, supporters, sponsors, and things like that. So it's like, there's really no one to blame besides, you know, people not supporting. So, you know, there's not really much to say about that. You know, if women were to start supporting women in sports, especially basketball, there would be tons of money you know if there were basketball moms who just love basketball to watch basketball like that'd be great mm -hmm. for, but yeah I wasn't expecting that that <laughs> angle or that take yeah because honestly if you look at it and you look at the facts of it like there's a lot of WNBA players that like go out and do talks and stuff to like you know promote the WNBA but if you look at the platforms that they go on, it's usually like men dominated platforms or like platforms that only men watch, like, you know, so mm -hmm. it's like, you don't expect a woman to come wake up in the morning and turn on sports center to see, you know, what happened in last night's game. So it's like, if women, you know, wanted to come out and support WNBA like that, then, you know, there would definitely be some more money to give out for sure. Yeah. I've been to a handful of games and it is, the the i mean i only went to in seattle to the storm but yeah. the demographic of who's actually going to those games it is a it seemed like it was like two groups of people they were catering to a 
clear LGBTQ community. And yeah. it was like middle-aged white women predominantly mm -hmm. from what I saw at those games. And yeah. then like young girls that play basketball and their parents. Yeah. And there's a big gap between like, those are two very different groups. Yeah. And I, I don't know if that's across the country for the WNBA or in women's basketball across the board, but like there, there's a lot of different types of NBA fans. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. You're right about that. It, that really is the demographic that is, you know, supporting it. It's either like really old, like older people, like older, older people, like seniors or like middle-aged LGBTQ community people or like, young women who think you know like young players and their fathers or mothers who want them to see like oh this is what you could be one day kind of thing it's yeah. never like wearing a Steph Curry jersey <laughs> yeah yeah like <laughs> there needs to be more like you know marketing in the WNBA it has to start there you know it's not going to start at any other level yeah yeah it's uh I mean and to be fair it's a younger league and mm -hmm. like I mean, watching all those documentaries on like the dream team and like the NBA has been a marketing machine. Like it's, it, this didn't happen overnight and to get a league, any league, like the MLS or whatever, like they don't have the presence that, you know, those major leagues have. So it's not to compare the two seems silly. Yeah, you can't realistically, you can't. And if any woman were to ever tell you that like basketball player wise, that we should be getting paid. Like I understand soccer a hundred percent, but like women's national basketball association, like y'all got to do better. Like, you know, like even NCAA, like college D one schools, like they have supporters who will come to those women's games and support them die hard. So it's like, I don't know why the league just won't yeah. try and get out there. And it's like, like you mentioned the LGBTQ thing, like, you know, everyone's not going to, unfortunately not everyone's going to accept that so it's like there has to be a different kind of avenue to reach to yeah it's using that from like a marketing perspective too is confusing to me like i don't we yeah. don't need to go like super deep in this just <laughs> but it's right. like those are two i mean to me that's that's a weird approach to like like i get it that you want to be accepting of all different types of backgrounds and stuff but to use it as like we're marketing towards these people specifically that seems Odd. weird to me like that you're yeah. exploiting no it in ways so it's no correlation like you've never seen the nba come out and be like you know yeah this is specifically the group of people we're looking for also to be like just uh, criticism here. I watched multiple games. Halftime shows are substantially like, like they are, there was like a seventh grade kids choir at halftime. And like nobody, nobody wants to watch that halftime no. a professional sports game. Like, no, maybe the has, national anthem. Like, yeah, <laughs> it makes you think like, is it professional like is this like you have to think of it like when you're at that level you're at an elite level like this there's no going higher than that so it's like there has to be some better like i don't know, I don't and, know. Um, the fans like just are not like i've been trying to like bring this on stage for stand of a little bit because like like i went to several wnba games and like the fans don't really know the game so like <gasps> though a team will take a timeout with five minutes left in the second quarter and it'll be met with a thunderous standing ovation and you're like yeah. what do you do like this or, or yeah. the ball goes out of bounds and they the team keeps possession and nothing has changed in the game they're like yeah and you're like what right. yeah like you know what's happening right now you're just like cheering <laughs> to cheer which is it would be so <laughs> weird like, yeah no it would, it would be like going to an nfl game and the running back gets like stopped at the line of scrimmage on first down so it's second and ten and yeah. then everybody in the arena is like yeah. like oh, it just doesn't make any sense <laughs> yeah no it's funny that you 
point that out because I definitely noticed that in a few Aces games. Like, y'all are screaming at the ref for something that's blatant. Like, what are we cheering for? Like, the announcers are, like, overly excited, trying to get everyone pumped up. And it's just, like, I don't know. It kind of just feels like a like a bar game going on. Like, you're, drink you're sitting there, you're drinking your beer, and it's, like, you're just watching this game, but it's not making any sense to everyone else around you. Yeah. Yeah. Like you're just having a conversation and it's happening in the background to exactly. be fair though. The other side of this is I know a handful of people that are hardcore WNBA fans and mm -hmm. they love the game. They follow it. So there is definitely an audience and people that are passionate about it. Yeah. I had that experience, but like, that's just my experience with this on a limited basis. So I try not to like, absolutely like single things out but yeah um, yeah going we back to that support though 100 percent, we can definitely support y'all so um last question before the story time like how long do you see yourself playing for like can, are you going back overseas or is it like is this the end or what what's the plan <laughs> what's next um you know it's been a question for me since i ended yeah so since the season has ended in Morocco I've been contemplating there was a lot of things I wasn't prepared for um going into Morocco so it's like I have to take that into consideration if I were to sign another contract so right now I'm kind of just in a period where it's like I'm preparing myself to be ready for a new contract but um like I know they'll come it's just a waiting game but it's also like you know I because of that year that I spent out of basketball and exploring the world and exploring this new person. Um, I'm not shying away from that at all. Like I've reached my goal the first, literally the first year playing pro basketball. So to be able to do that, um, I think it's kind of just been a question for myself, whether I want to do this continuously or if it's just like, you know, what's my next thing. But um, I have some things lined up I'm excited for. So uh, we'll see when next year comes around what the new thing is with me. But, yeah, I got my hands in some different pots. So we'll see. Nice. So, yeah. I'm excited. All right. Yeah. I'm going to queue up our story time music. You you still have something prepped for us? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I just always ask because I didn't I didn't know if we burned through it in some of the conversation. but. Uh, we got some music here, so give me just a second. It's story time. It's story time with Adam. Yeah, it's story time. It's story time with Adam and friends. Love it. All right, so I, I asked, like, anything related to travel, basketball, or, like, your biggest game ever, um, or just if you had a specific story you wanted to tell? Yeah, um, well, I'll just, like, tie it all into one. Um, I don't really share this a lot with other people or, like, a lot of people don't know. Um, I was actually adopted in my, like, into my own family, thankfully, but um, yes, yeah, so I was adopted into my aunt, uncle adopted me. And uh, my uncle was actually, uh, who's my dad now because I they had me since I was a baby. So my mom and dad are my uncle and aunt. And um, I got into basketball because my dad was UNLV legend, NBA all-star, overseas champion um and just like kind of just like the mentor and leader and example that I followed coming up into life and uh, I got to spend my entire life playing basketball around pros you know all my brothers played and things like that and so I think that's really important to touch on because looking at my accomplishment my first year in Morocco um just thinking about playoffs we were 0-1 playing at home, and this was like the game that we had to win to get to the championship, to even have a chance to win. And um, we were losing the whole first half. Uh, it was really rough. Like it was, it was, it was a lot of tension 
on our bench and on the floor just because everyone wanted to win. And like, you know, the whole thing about not having a strategy wasn't there. So it was like, we had to figure it out all on our own. Mm -hmm. And so um, I remember I was playing like crap because I was coming off of being sick. I was playing like crap and uh, just like not in my rhythm that first half. And I remember at halftime, like everyone's screaming at each other in Arabic and French and English and like so much going on. I just remember sitting in the half, like in the locker room at halftime, like, this is it like it's either it's now or never and it's like I'm kind of like putting myself back into all those workouts with my dad and my brother and I'm just like you know what like this could potentially be my last game in Morocco I'm just gonna do it like whatever happens happens and so um <clears throat> I remember we came out and third quarter picked up the other American picked up some big boards and points for us. So that like got us back in the game. And then fourth quarter came and I was like, okay, like this is, it has to be on me. I'm like the best guard on the team. Like I'm kind of the generator. So at this point I'm like, I'm taking over like point guard and I, I'm ready. I got my cape on and uh, there's a play. I, I think I posted on Instagram where I just literally get the ball from out of bounds and I'm dribbling up the floor everyone's just like standing waiting and see what I'm going to do and I just like shoot a three from like the volleyball line and it cash and like everyone's just like oh shit like tie game like okay like and I think like from that point on I went on a 6-0 run myself like I hit that three and then I hit another deep three after that they just kept leaving me open and I just kept shooting and from that point in the game like our momentum just completely changed and uh we ended up winning the game and it was a big huge celebration and I'm just like trying to remind everyone like we have one more game we have to win like one more game y'all haven't won since 2011 like we have to I have to take this home for y'all and so like that was really fun because I had to tap into a completely different mentality and like self like motivation mm -hmm. and um that was probably the most fun game of my life like we ended up winning the championship I had a great defensive game that game and we got to celebrate with the city coming home and take the trophy and I got to sleep with the trophy and it was just everything was just so cool but honestly if I would have never just said like forget what they're trying to tell me in Arabic and just play <laughs> basketball like <laughs> everything changed from then and like it changed my life honestly and my outlook on what I want so that's awesome yeah. that's a yeah. great story I love that too because it's there's all that like preparation stuff and like planning and strategy and then like I think all of that training that you talked about through your family and just like basketball experience like as long as you just play like that's that's all you're trying to do but there's all these yeah. mental games around it the numbers game and it's like when you as a player you can get wrapped up in that because it's like I can't have too many turnovers I can't take too many shots in my shooting percentage I'm like dude if you just like if people just like said like I don't care about who's in front of me I'm going to win this game or I'm going to do this like if more people had that mentality like there'd be mm -hmm. so many great people like running around here playing basketball yeah. honestly yeah, yeah. The game is that that influence of the game has dramatically changed it but it's yeah. that's that's awesome I love that story well um if if people want to find you on social or like any do you have a website or like what anything to promote yeah, please follow my Instagram page, Nice Page, N Y S P A G E. Um, I have a YouTube out there. You can find me, Anaya Rodisha. And uh, if any new things are happening, you'll definitely see it there first. Awesome. Thank yeah. you for coming on. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks everybody for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to rate and review us. If you're watching us on YouTube, hit that notifications bell so you don't miss our upcoming content. And then if you like the episode, like it and throw a question or comment in for Anaya or myself. And as always, if you're following us on, on Instagram, make sure to look out new content every Monday. We're going to leave you guys with Jaga. I just make the waves, I don't write them. I can hear the lyrics in my spirit as I write them. Why you want to walk and talk just like them? 
I can't get caught up in all the hype and the excitement I just make the waves, I don't write them I can hear the lyrics in my spirit as I write them Why you wanna walk and talk just like them? I can't get caught up in all the hype and the excitement Welcome to my wave pool, my wave pool Welcome to my wave pool, my wave pool Welcome to my wave pool, my wave pool Welcome to my wave pool